that should be us started. Um, so yes, so welcome everybody and thank you again for joining us um, on our February talk uh, for the Sterling and Clax SWT local group. Um, so our speaker tonight is going to be the fantastic speaker of Stuart Benz. Um, so I've got a little introductory um, thing just about Stuart before we get started and then I'll hand over to him. Um, so Stuart um, is a young naturalist historian whose enthusiasm for the natural world is infectious. He is currently in the final stages of his PhD from the Scottish School of Forestry at the University of the Highlands and Islands, having previously gained a BSc on in Conservation Biology and Management at the University of Stirling and an MSc in Ecology from Aberdeen. Since 2020, Stuart's been on a placement with Nature Scott. He is one of the keenest young naturalists you will come across, and his talk will show you how he successfully created a garden for wildlife. As an undergraduate, he played a leading role in Stirling University's Nature Society. He is one of our committee members and co-chair of the Butterfly Conservation Glasgow and South West Branch. He has created a garden designed to attract wildlife and hopes to encourage you to follow in his footsteps. So the title of um, Stuart's talk is Bringing Wildlife to Your Garden. So I am now just going to hand over to Stuart um, for his talk. So thank you, Stuart. Oh, thank you very much, Ali. I'll just hopefully share my screen. Can everybody see that okay? That's this up. Yep. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. So hopefully, can you see the top bit of my screen? Or is that? Uh, yeah, no, we can see it. It's not, right. uh, yeah, it's not about the Zoom bar or anything like that. That's fine, just check it. Well, thank you everybody for coming along. So, and thank you for that introduction. So, basically bringing wildlife to your garden. What I'm hopefully going to show tonight is I'm going to show a wee bit about my own garden and what that looks like um, and some of the things we've put in. And then I'm going to do a wee bit of a tour around the sort of things that you can do to encourage wildlife um, to your garden. Uh, different measures you can do and different types of uh, kind of wildlife enhancements. Um, and I'll hopefully show off some of the wildlife as I do that. So why are gardens so important um, or why should we wildlife garden? Well, our gardens, you can see here a picture of an area of housing. The gardens make up a huge amount of room. And if you can see my pointer on the screen, I mean, if you think about that corridor there of gardens, it's quite a lot of ground. And as well as that, the gardens are helping to connect to the natural world as well around about. Um, so, Gardens can help connect wildlife, they can help to be a nature reserve, they can help to um, basically give another reserve for a while. Some for very rare wildlife do very well in our gardens, and these urban networks are key. So don't underestimate the value of your garden. Gardens are also really good for us. They're good for our mental health, and seeing wildlife in our gardens is good for mental health. But also our gardens do help provide things like pollinator services. And also we want those in our garden, and pest control, natural pest control as well, for those plants we don't want eaten, can be provided by a lot of our friendly wildlife. So this is what my garden did look like. It look, look, look like. I have since moved house uh, very recently, but this was the garden. So the aspiration was to have our own little woodland. And I, I think you probably agree that we, we did manage to do that. Um, the garden had about 10 different species of native tree put in there. We've got some poplars in the front as well that we added, as well as there's Scots pines dotted about, there's flowering cherries, there's hawthorns in the back, and also there's a whole mix of ground plants. So there's lots, unfortunately I had to take this picture in the autumn, but there's lots of primroses, there's lots of cowslips, there's lots of bluebells, and there's a range of other pollinator friendly plants built in. But at the same time, we still have a grass lawn, we still have an area to dry washing, we still have a vegetable pot and a potting shed, we still have somewhere where you can sit with a fire. So the garden still has functionality as well as being able to take wildlife. This garden has over 400 species, not including the plants, 400 species, mostly of insect, to be honest, recorded for the garden. Uh, and I know somebody that's got 1,500 recorded in the garden, so I'm not even halfway to their total. So it's amazing what you can get. This garden even has some first records for uh, Lanarkshire, where it's based from. So you can even get quite rare things in your garden and support them. 
So a wee bit more, this is more down at the ground level. We've got, they've got a spring in the summer. It, it did grow up quite a bit in summer. There is a pond down in here in front that's well covered. And in this particular photo, it had about 12 frogs in it. It's a tiny little pond, as you can see. It's not, it's not massive, um, but still it didn't get a lot of frogs breeding. But when it came to the warm weather, they were more than happy to sit in there. Uh, and then they would come out in the wetter evenings and hunt the slugs through the garden and did a very good job of it. And then you can see we had quite a resource and kind of spring flowering plants, got the odd dead log lying at the side in log pile, amazing some of the creatures that you can get in your garden. And I'll show some of them off later, um, just from having some dead wood about and building that into your garden. Bark covered, A helps keep the weeds down, B amazing how much lives under that. And you'll get loads of blackbirds and robins coming around and basically digging through it, looking for all the nice little tasty invertebrates that are living underneath there as well. So it's actually a bit of a feature in its own. And you can see lots of different types of trees, some rowans with their berries coming, and that's helping to bring some real diversity into the garden. However, I moved and when we moved, moved to Fife, um, we moved to this, uh, a very bare garden, though nice landscape in the background perhaps, but nice old hedgerow. It's been there for about 120, 150 years, um, but the garden was fairly empty. So that was about eight months ago. It now looks like this. Uh, I have to say it's my father who's actually done most of this and has planned most of it, but we tried to plan in as much things for wildlife in this, as well as it being a functional garden, as well as it looking nice and neat and tidy. So wildlife gardens, it's always the thing I've heard said is all wildlife gardens have to be messy. Uh, they, they really don't. They don't need to be wet messy. Uh, over in this far corner here, we've got six different species of native trees and a little woodland. So there's going to be lots of things feeding off of those trees. We've got a little log pile under the feet of this nice impala who's standing there. Never thought you'd get an impala attracted to your garden, but there you go. So some log piles in there. Um, this is something actually that my, my dad quite likes in gardens is to have um, lots of kind of cypress trees and a kind of arboretum of cypresses. Which, yeah, okay, it might not sound like it's got a lot in wildlife, but actually one of the things we've found is, um, yeah, we get a lot of nesting birds using them when they grow up. And actually, in our last garden, Dunnocks and Blackbirds were loving these little areas that we had in it. So that's getting an element of the garden, a kind of more showy gardener's element, but it's still providing for wildlife. You can have both things. Um, got lots of ponds, there's one there, there's a, one in front and there's one over to the far side as well, hopefully you see my mouse pointing about as well, and obviously your bird tables, and again, unfortunately, I had to also take this picture in the back end of the year, so we've got lots of pollinator friendly plants for a whole range of pollinators in the front, and the place is also loaded with lots of different bulbs as well, so to get that spring pollinators as well. Off shot, there's also a nice wildflower meadow we've just sown, and even this area of what looks like quite immunity grass has a whole load of different wild, short wildflowers sown into that as well. So that's some pictures we did manage to get when it was a bit nearer to a kind of flowering bit of year, and you can see some nice foxgloves in the woodland bit, and there was also things like primrose, dog violets, cowslips, uh, some broadleafed hellebrine orchids as well, some common spotted orchids too, all into this sort of wild woodland area as well. And one of the big features for me that came with this garden was a hedgerow. It has a, head, a native hedgerow at the bottom. Unfortunately, during development, it had been disturbed somewhat. Um, so we'd replanted some hawthorns into it to bulk it back out uh, and had also sown a nice hedge wildflower mix in here as well to really sort of link this up as a corridor. And it's amazing the amount of wildlife, the amount of butterflies particularly. But even when I was running the moth trap at an early stage in this garden, we were getting so many insects using the hedgerow. And I would actually stand in the wall and just watch flying insects going up and down the hedgerow. And you, you'll hear these referred to kind of highways and that's what was going on as they were acting as a highway uh, and of course the obligatory kind of bird baths and things as well we've got a few of these dotted about for different birds hidden in different places as well so the first thing to i'm going to go through some of the things you can do for your garden and plants will feature as a big part of that and one of the major major things i wanted to start with is 
please, please, please go peat free. Try and avoid plants that are grown in peat. Try and avoid, uh, or do avoid using peat in your garden. This is a, a bog in Dumfries and Galloway, though we have some absolutely lovely, some of the best examples in Stirlingshire area. These are got so much wildlife, so many of our native butterflies and moths, for example, maybe three, four hundred species are associated with bogs like this. They are full of biodiversity, but they are a bit like a balloon. Um, so if you imagine a water balloon and if somebody cuts a big hole in it to take the peat out or even cuts a ditch, the balloon bursts and all the water goes out. Very much the same happens. They're very sensitive in their hydrology, their water storage. And if you make a hole in them, the water escapes. And then they start to degrade. They're actually a massive carbon store. So as they degrade, all that carbon goes into the air. And with our current climate crisis, that's also not very good. So yeah, we don't want to disturb these. So please don't use peat in the garden. They have lots of rare things like this. Bad picture. There's a lot of bad pictures scattered throughout this. But I quite like to try and show some of the pictures I've taken. And I usually just tend to see things with my iPhone and do a quick, oh, look at that. That'll be interesting. Sometimes pictures are not great. But I was going to show you them anyway, because I quite enjoyed taking them. So that's bog rosemary, one of our rarer plants, only found in peat bogs. Actually, isn't related to rosemary, but it does. you can see where it got its name from. Oh, I've went one too far. So pollinators probably one of the bigger things that we've all heard about and what we all want to concentrate on in our garden. Um, so one of the, the first things is pollinators are not just bees. And there's not just one type of bee. The honey bee that we've got here isn't our only type of bee. That's one of the types of bee we have, but we also have things like the solitary bee. We also have things like uh, the bumblebees and within the bumblebees even, we also have the cuckoo bees. So cuckoo bees are a type of bumblebee that basically sneak into, as the name might suggest, like the bird, they sneak into other bees' nests and leave their eggs behind and then leave quickly and allow that colony of bees to bring them up for them. So we've got whole loads of different types of bees. We also have things like this parasitic wasp that's here about to attack a cinnabar caterpillar. These are essential actually for pest control. Um, basically any herbivorous insect that's going to eat your plants, there'll be a matching parasitoid wasp that will happily inject their eggs into them and then their larva hatch out. And basically, usually it's a caterpillar and will eat it from the inside out and then burst out as new wasps or burst out and form little pupae on the outside. It's sort of horror film-like, but they are essential for keeping kind of herbivorous insects in check and cycling along so their numbers don't get too high. But the adults must have a nectar source. They really do need nectar. Um, you've got the moths and butterflies, including this lovely little Magnoptrix moth. This is a tiny, tiny wee moth that eats pollen grains. You'll see it in the spring on buttercups, sometimes in huge numbers. It's a kind of shiny golden purple colour. It's, um, it's tiny, but it's absolutely amazing. So look out for them in buttercups. And there's not a lot of information on these being pollinators, but well, they're running around in the plants and getting covered in pollen, so we would assume that they probably do quite well. We've got beetles, even your social wasps, they, they do a lot more than just sting and they will feature in other bits of the talk. They're really the gardener's friend. And then also we've got things like hoverflies and many, many more insects. So what, what does a pollinator want? And I should say a thank you here to Lorna Blackmore, who was also involved in the Nature Site at Stirling Uni and uh, came along to the local group a lot um, because Lorna lent me a whole load of her slides because she works uh, with pollinators. And she's lent me some fantastic slides and pictures that I've used over the next few slides. So what do bees want or what do pollinators want? And some of this is a bit bee-based because we tend to actually know more about bees. A lot of the research and the studies have been on bees, but we can sort of extrapolate it against other pollinators. And it's important to remember those other pollinators as well because we need all of them. Um, so what, what does a bee or a, what does a pollinator want? And what it wants is it wants pollen and it wants nectar and it needs to get them from down in the flower. And you can see this tulip has had a petal removed and it's got nectaries in the bottom and the pollen is stored on the anthers up here. So the pollen is a protein source. That's where they get their protein. Like us, people will say to us, you know, that we should eat 
omega-3, you know, so we should be eating things like fish, um, and that will give us lots of this. And these are our essential amino acids, basically the building blocks that help build bits of our body. Exactly the same is true for many insects, especially actually in bees. And bees use this for their grubs to develop. So it's not just a case of they can go to any old flower. They have to go to a range, a diversity of flowers to make sure they get all their essential amino acids. Because some provide some amino acids better than others. For example, the pea family, the foxglove family. So basically, a young bee is probably going to be told not to eat your fish to get your omega-3. Um, but for their amino acids, they'll be told, well, eat your foxglove pollen. Um, and that's going to be essential for them. The next thing is nectar. Nectar is a really key sugar resource, but also it's where a lot of insects get their water at the same time. Uh, and sometimes if you water plants in a dry period, you'll see more pollinators come along because suddenly there's a water source there with the nectar. So they need to be able to get these resources. And there's one other key thing that they do. And some for a lot of pollinators, this is a sultry bee, they act as a lovely little platform for them to warm up. So the petals round the flower, that reflects sunlight into the middle of the flower, makes it nice and warm, and helps the bee to warm up its flight muscles so it can take off. So that's another way that the plant has learned to bring the pollinator in to get its pollen to, try to carry it to other plants to pollinate them, as well as the nectar that it's given them. So obviously, they need to be able to get at these resources. So we've got a crane's bill flower here, and we've got a nice open wild dog rose here. And you can see these big open flowers. You know, you can see where the pollen is. The nectar's going to be in there as well. The pollinators can get to it. And if you look at these more cultivated plants, like the rose here, you can see there is no way the pollinator is getting in there easily. And in fact, some we have bred the plants so much that the pollinator isn't, there's just nothing there for them. They've actually bred out most of the nectaries and also the anthers as well. We've basically sterilized the plants uh, so they look nice and showy, but they're not doing anything. So these are a few basic things that, you know, look for when you're looking for plants to put in your garden that are good for pollinators. Um, and one of the key things I always say to folks, if you're at the garden center, watch where the bees are going, find some bees and look where they're going. And that's usually a good way to go. Or if you see a butterfly flap across the garden center, give it a chase uh, and see what it lands on. That's usually a good way to see what flowers can be used. One thing we have to also look at, and I think this, this is all on bumblebees, but it's the same across all insects. The, a lot of insects, you know, they need to be able to land on the flower. So they need flowers at the right size to be the right platform to land on, or they can't land. But also, the, a lot of bees and a lot of other insects, like butterflies and moths, their tongue lengths range enormously, but they have different lengths of tongue. So they need flowers that they can reach the nectar on. And also they don't even, they don't want to be always competing with other bees. So some bees will prefer like the garden bumblebee, it's got a 12 millimeter long tongue. So it can go for plants that have a really long nectar tube and it knows it can get the nectar from those and the other bees can't. So it's not competing with them. So they've evolved all these different tongue lengths to try and lessen the competition between each other. But it does mean that us putting in one or two good plants aren't going to do it. A, they need those essential amino acids, but they are also going to need flowers that they can get their different lengths of tongue into. And just to illustrate that a wee bit, we've got, here's a garden bumblebee, really cool bumblebee. You'll notice it when it flies in, if you get a good look. If you look closely at this one, this is a picture of my own garden, and you'll see this big, uh, this is where the tongue is, the sheath that protects the tongue, and you can see how long it is. And it's going for cowslips. And um, because it's got that big long tongue to get into those cowslips and is a, pro a really important pollinator for these longer kind of stemmed or tube, nectar tubed plants so that they can really get in and get the pollen out. So it's important to have this range of bees also for pollination as well. And I've got some results on these slides. These again come from Lorna and from the On The Verge project that run in Stirlingshire. And she looked at what plants in the meadows that these bees were particularly going to. So you can see again, Viper's burglos is right up there. So these are these longer, you know, longer flower, longer nectar tube. And that's the one that the garden bumblebee's gone, I can get in that easily. A lot of other bees can't get that, but I'll get it. 
Um, and then some of some of these flowers do have shorter nectar tubes, but they're big enough landing platforms for it to be able to get in and angle that big long tongue down and be able to get them. That's quite important for butterflies as well. If you watch like a peacock butterfly ever trying to get into a daffodil and trying to work out how it has to land on it and then stretch the proboscis round to suck the nectar out, the nectary that it can't quite reach and it's having to reposition itself and hang off the flower so it can get into the nectar. So. Basically, the more flowers we have of different shapes, sizes, plant families, the better. Um, and again, there's another one here showing for the buff-tailed bumblebee, one of our shorter-tongued bees. And you can see there's things like wild carrot. It's got very, very shallow nectaries. Um, they do a really cool thing with wild carrot, actually, where they buzz over the surface and they get all the pollen stuck to themselves. They kind of build up the static, get the pollen stuck to themselves, and then you'll see them combing it off and putting it in their pollen baskets to take back to the hive to feed to the young or to back to the nest and then feed to the young larva. And it's really cool to see them make a cool noise when they're doing that on wild carrot. So if you see wild carrot, have a look at what the bees are doing. But they're also really clever and they're not going to leave the things like the garden bumblebee to get all of that nectar resource. So they come along to the flowers and they do a thing that they call nectar robbing, where they bite a nice little hole in the flower into where the nectar is stored. And you can see an example there with the hole and then they stick in their tongue and they drink the nectar. So it's called nectar robbing. Sometimes the plants don't get the benefit of it because it usually bypasses where the pollen is stored. So they can get the nectar out without getting any pollen on themselves. So they're not actually really doing any pollination when they do that. But if you look, especially if you've got early um, flowering bell heather, and if you have a wee look in your bell heather flowers, you will quite often see these little holes bitten into the bottom of the bell heather. And quite often you might watch a butterfly or a hoverfly coming along and using the holes that the bees have made so they can get some nectar too. Um, you see that, I've watched that particularly with a peacock butterfly doing that before. So this is a question that people ask me quite often if I do events and things with butterfly conservation, people say, look, I've got this amazing garden, there, there, there's flowers everywhere, there's nectar and pollinator friendly flowers, they're just everywhere. Um, but I don't see any butterflies. I never get any butterflies coming to my garden. What's went wrong? Now, this actual garden I've shown in the pit, and by butterflies, the ones are usual meaning the things like the peacock, the comma, the small tortoiseshell, but the nice bright coloured ones basically as well. But why don't I get them in my garden? Um, because I've, you know, I've got all these flowers. This garden here actually does have loads of them. Um, and there's one reason for that. And it's because it's got nettles around about the perimeter of the garden. So it's a walled garden. And just outside the walled garden is fields and fields of nettles. And those three butterflies I showed, the peacock, the small tortoiseshell, and the comma, this is their food plant, their main food plant. The caterpillars eat nettles. And I've actually got here, that's some peacocks, that's some small tortoiseshell larva, and this is them feeding on the nettles. So no nettles nearby, no place for the butterfly to lay eggs, nothing for its young to feed on, no butterflies. And this is the main reason that we can see them missing in gardens, because everybody's thought about those pollinator friendly plants for the nectar, even for the pollen, but I've not thought about for those insects that need larva food plants, so caterpillar food plants for butterflies and moths, they haven't thought about those and they've not included those. It doesn't have to be nettles, a lot of our wild plants will do this, some for garden plants too, but especially our wild plants, so if you can have a wild corner in your garden and have some nice wild plants in it, it is really going to help and it is going to really bring in a lot of other species. And I've got a few examples. So this is a lichenus, it's a moth, it's a rather crazy patterned moth. It is a brown moth, not all moths are brown, there's some amazing coloured moths as you might spy from the one underneath. But this one, look at the patterns on it, it's amazing. There's a lot of examples of things in this talk that are butterflies and moths. I would love to say it's for some ecology reason, like the, the indicator species. And, you know, if you have good butterflies and moths, you'll have lots of good other stuff, which is true. But it's more because I tend to do lots of stuff for butterflies and moths and tend to have lots of pictures of them. So this moth, it's caterpillars feeding this lovely plant, red campion, one of our wild plants. And you'll notice it's got some other pictures next to this. And this is because red campion does some other things roundabout. Red campion 
tends to get really, really attacked by aphids. And I've got some kind of black aphid here on mine and they're sucking away the sugar from the plant. Now you might notice this sort of um, kind of beigey, kind of yellowy colored thing on the side. This is a hoverfly larva eating the aphids. So some hoverfly larva are predatory and they will actually eat the aphids. So this one's actually running around eating the aphids. So we're now supporting the moth. So that's one pollinator. We're also got another one because we're actually supply, we're providing food for the young uh, hoverfly. Um, and then things like this happen. So this is a parasitoid wasp attacking the hoverfly larva. So it's now laying its eggs into the hoverfly larva. Um, so we've put in one plant and we've got a whole little ecosystem built up already. So you can have one plant and think about what that's already done for your garden and the potential wildlife that that's brought in, as well as your bees are quite like that one as well. So we've then got things like the elephant hawk moth, perhaps one of the, the favourites of all the moth trappers. This is one from my own garden, from my own moth trap. First one I got from my own garden. Uh, amazing thing to open your moth trap and you'll find it in there. Um, Caterpillar looks amazing as well. It's quite big. Um, and it does, people say it looks like a snake. And well, yeah, it does. I know two vets, in fact, who have uh, had these handed in as escaped snakes. But actually, no, they're not. They're popular hawkmoth caterpillars instead. Uh, or sorry, elephant hawkmoth caterpillars. They feed on this plant, rosemary willow herbs. Some of you might know it as fireweed. They actually feed on some of the other willow herbs and also fuchsia as well. So if you have a fuchsia and you see a big caterpillar or big bits going off your fuchsia, you might be really lucky and look out for this and let it eat a bit for your fuchsia. Look at the amazing moths you'll get. Um, but often it's rosemary willow herb. Um, and yeah, that you'll see that quite a bit all over. But again, you know, no rosemary willow herb, no elephant hawk moth. I decided to put in a few more as well as they've got things like the streamer, the bar jello. These feed on roses, mostly the wild rose, mostly the dog rose, though um, particularly bar jello will go a little bit for cultivated roses as well. I certainly had them feeding on cultivated roses in my garden as well. When we say wildlife gardening, you know, people do like to have certain types of cultivated flowers and yeah they might not be good for pollinators but it's about getting that mix so yeah put that put in the plants you like as well but also think about what ones you can get and it's not an all or nothing you can select the things you put in and mix them and you might get nice surprises like finds you've actually got barred yellow feeding on them too and then you've got things like this amazing cinnabar moth and you can see these danger coloured larva with the kind of yellow and black stunning larva uh, that are feeding on ragwort and of course ragwort unfortunately gets to it can be toxic to some livestock it's not really to humans unless you're touching loads and loads of it or eating it or doing something kind of silly with it to be honest so basically it, it, it gets targeted because it's got this bad image of being very poisonous and it gets targeted and it gets taken away but unfortunately loads of our pollinators love it as well as things that will actually feed off it and actually I, I love just finding areas of this um, kind of midsummer and looking for things like antler moths on it and you will find loads of moths even by day feeding off of this um, it's a really strong nectar plant so if you can keep it you can let it into the area of your garden please do because it, it's, it's an amazing kind of wildflower to have so one thing you can do as a kind of measure you can put in your garden is you can plant a meadow. And meadows can come in all shapes and sizes. Um, you usually cut them once, maybe twice a year. Can depends a bit on the seed mix that you've got going. Um, so if you're somebody that doesn't really want to cut the lawn all the time, which is my sort of opinion to lawns, they're fantastic because you just need to cut them once. Um, so you can get quite tall ones. This is quite a tall seed mix you see in the top corner here. And then underneath you've got one with the kind of cornflowers, corn marigolds and mayweeds and things. This one's quite a bit shorter, maybe more colorful as well. So you, you can select the type of meadow you want. And I've actually sown into all of my grass areas, things like Jamander Speedwell, white clover, cell field, because yeah, we still want some short grass areas. And for utility, we still want some short grass areas. But instead of it just being plain old grass, these are all things that 
pollinators, especially the bees, are going to love. So let's introduce some of them into the grass and make it a bit more biodiverse so that it's helping serve some wildlife value, as well as being some more normal utility grass. And don't forget the trees. Um, just as plants are really important for supporting our wildlife, if you can get a native tree or at least a species that's sort of na near native into your garden, wow, the amount of wildlife that you can bring to your garden, even with one tree. Um, and remember, a lot of broadleaf trees, a lot of people worry about them growing too tall, but you can coppice your trees and keep a lot of broadleaves quite short and actually bush them out quite a lot. And they tend to get a lot of foliage that way, which tends to be quite good for a lot of insects. And, you know, they do multiple roles. So you've got peacock butterfly here, which is feeding on some willow. Uh, so they're great for pollinators trees. You've got, this is horse chestnut leaf miner. It's a moth. Um, it's one to watch out for in Scotland. It wasn't known to, from Scotland until a few years ago. Uh, I've started finding it in loads of places in Scotland over last year. So worth having a look out if you see these weird little lines and chestnut leaves here. Uh, that, that's what it is. It's horse chestnut leaf miner. But again, it needs a chestnut tree to feed on. Um, but I've put in some figures there. You know, an oak tree. 2,300 species can be supported on an oak. Um, 229 are only on oak. Now, oak's a big tree to put in your garden. But what about a wee silver birch? There's over 300 plus species found in birch. I actually think that number's a bit low, thinking about the number of moths that will eat birch. I would think that number's probably higher. So as you can see, one tree can get a lot. And also, something like a rowan, you will get plenty of moths feeding off of the foliage you will also get quite a lot of pollinators feeding off of the flowers. And then you'll get things like all your thrushes feeding off it during the summer. So if you can get a native tree in your garden, it is a real way to really boost the wildlife. Even if they're in as a hedgerow, um, these can really boost the wildlife to your garden. And I've put, again, quite moth heavy. So I've got my garden here, as you can see, it's attracted an impala again, but on top of that, it's got lots of um, different tree species in it. So we've got things like poplar hawk moth and figure of 80. Now, poplar hawk moth in Scotland tend to feed on willow trees, but in this situation, it was actually feeding off the poplars in the garden, and so was the figure of 80 moth. So by having the, these poplars, and actually poplar, a lot of things that feed on willow will feed on poplar. Um, so it was full of caterpillars. I used to run around underneath there in the autumn as they would drop down to overwinter, as caterpillars would overwinter in the soil, all sorts of species coming off them. You've got things like centre-barred sallow, which is on the willows, the scalloped oak, which will feed on quite a number of trees. Grey dagger, which is similar here, it was feeding on uh, the round trees in the middle of the garden. This, and this is something that I only learned in the last few years actually exist. And I think they're one of the more amazing creatures um, that are out there. And it is a moth, it's a micro moth. This is Coleophora serratella. This is one of the Coleophora moths and they carry their home with them. They are like the hermit crab of the moth world. They make a little case for themselves out of vegetation, usually bits of leaf. And then they crawl around eating away. Sometimes they stick their head in the leaf and they just eat out the center of the leaf or they eat a bit of the outside, but they have this protective case, usually keep the parasitoid wasps away. So if you have a good look, Coleophora serratella is really common. And at this time of year, if you have a look at a birch tree and look at where the branches branch off and look at that, that bit, that V shape where the branches branch off and have a look for a wee sort of brown rice kind of shaped object, it's probably going to be Coleophora serratella. So the other one, if you if you've never seen a Coleophora, is have a look at rush heads. You know, so like your soft rush, your hard rush, have a look at the head of the rush. And if you see these little white grains on it, there's two different species that are on there. I didn't know they existed till a few years ago. I'm now totally fascinated from them. There's loads of them. Really difficult to identify as an adult really easy to identify when they're young because most of them are on unique plants so if you know you've got one and the, kind of what the case looks a bit like and you know what plant it came from you can say oh that's that's that or that's most likely to be that this moth is not a native um triple barred argent i found the name for i'm not sure if that's an official name anywhere a lot of the micro moths sadly are still just in the gallic name or the latin names rather um but you will this is a stunning moth. It feeds inside 
the cypress trees. Most people who have cypress or have this moth, it is, it is tiny. Um, but if you get a hold of one and have a good look at it, it's a kind of shiny, almost goldy metallic color with these bright white stripes and three wee white dots on it. As you'll see from the bad quality photo, it's literally tiny, but they're absolutely amazing. So if you've got cypress trees, have a look at coming into springtime around your cypresses, kind of mid to late spring, because uh, I almost guarantee you'll find these and they're a fascinating wee moth. And then you've got things like nut tree tussock, which is a lovely, nice fluffy moth. Uh, and that feeds a whole variety of trees. Now, Moths are sort of the example, but where there's moths, there's lots of other insects feeding. So just to show the importance of what a tree can bring to your garden. And I thought I would show a nice wee close up of the figure of 80 moth. I, I actually had this a couple of years in a row, uh, with quite a few of them in the garden. And you can see why this one is called figure of 80, uh, as it's basically got its, its own name badge. Um, now, a lot of the moths are labelled quite sens sensible names, but this one really does carry its own name badge, uh, the figure of 80, and a lovely thing to see. So another thing that I would really encourage people to do is a fruit tree. I always just underrate this one as a kind of garden measure. Oh, if I put a fruit tree, that's that's more a thing for humans to get the apples or whatever. Well, actually, yeah, I would say it's one of the better things you can do. Put in a nice apple or a crab apple if you prefer. Put in any a cherry, a plum. A lot of things love to eat the leaves. So we've got this apple leaf miner moth. I really, the leaf mining moths are fascinating. These are moths that live in the middle of the leaf. And you can see this one here, this big spirally pattern started as a wee caterpillar in the leaf and it's got bigger and bigger as it's run around inside the leaf and eventually it'll pupate out as a moth. Um, and you can identify it just because that's an apple leaf with this type of mine that's on it. And they're really easy to identify. If you're interested in that, have a look at UK leaf miners. And I actually put my, my butterfly conservation hat on in our branch area, which covers Sterling Clacks or part of Clacks. Um, they're really under-recorded as they are in a lot of Stirling, or a lot of Scotland. So they are really worth looking for. And the same like this fire fern leaf miner. And that's what the adult looks like. Again, tiny, but look at the patterns on it. Lovely fluffy head as well. But also fruit trees are really liked by red mason bees. And these are a lovely bee to get. These ones, they don't form big nests. They're not social bee. They will, these are the ones, you know, when you see people put kind of bamboo, um, bee houses, you know, the bamboo canes. Well, this is the one that lives in the bamboo canes. And literally in that cane, it will um, put in some um, nectar pollen, put in an egg for it. So when it hatches, the larva has lots of food in there and it seals the end up so nothing can get in to disturb the larva. But these ones you really want, if you're growing fruit or strawberries, anything like that in your garden, you want these guys because these are some of the best fruit pollinators about. You will get perfectly formed strawberries. You'll get lots of apples. These guys you really want working for you in your garden. This one actually comes from down south. This is uh, when the Lord of Blackmore's photos again. And she sent me this from her fruit tree. And you've got a nice wee fly has come in to feed off the flower. And then this crab spider, which has made itself totally white is hiding on the blossom. And as the fly has landed, it has grabbed the fly and is now eating it. And the amount of people I know that have looked at this photo and have not noticed the spider, including myself when I was first sent it. Um, and the spider is hidden, perfectly camouflaged there. And also, yeah, they, they also produce apples, which you can, we, we do a sort of sharing system. So many of them get put out in the bad weather from the thrushes. And then so many of them come indoors to make chutney as well. And even quite small trees like that, we can get a good 15 jars of chutney out the trees, even with the moths eating the trees. We don't do any pest control. We let everything eat what it wants. And that brings to this moth. This is apple ermine moth. This is a really hard one to identify because you really need to see all the life stages, the caterpillars, the pupae through to the adults. But luckily, because it was in the garden, I got to see all of that. Uh, and it was one of the first records from my area. And you can see, yes, it will eat quite a bit of your tree. And yes, it will put netting around. But you do get a stunning moth. And it is a moth that's Probably we don't know a lot about it because it's it's not overly recorded, but it might not be doing very well with a lack of fruit trees. So it's really one you want to get. 
And I did, when I took this photo, this fly was buzzing around and you get parasitoid flies, like you get parasitoid wasps. So I'm not sure if this is one of them and it's sort of eyeing up the caterpillars and thinking, I could lay an egg in you, because it was showing a lot of interest in the caterpillars, but I'm not sure what it actually is. But it's amazing what you can see on a couple of fruit trees. And you can see all the pupae here in the middle of the net. They put up the net to keep these parasitoids out and you can see an adult that's emerged. And these are stunning moths that air mines. There's lots of them. They're absolutely stunning moths. One thing I would say, though, in plants is just be careful with invasive um, species and what you're putting in. A lot of things can escape from gardens. Historically, we've had things like few-leaved leek shown here. But it's now pushing out things like ransoms, uh, bluebells, a lot of our native bulb species. Uh, and, yeah, it's really affecting woodland diversity. Unfortunately, some of the things that we really like for pollinators, like buddleia or the butterfly bush, not so bad. It depends what habitat you're next to, but if you're next to a nice grass, grass, kind of grassy area or, you know, a meadow area, something like that, it's not cut very often or has lots of bare ground, this is probably going to end up taking it over. Um, so, yes, it's very nice for pollinators, but we do need to watch. Some varieties don't do this, so it's usually just the, the Davidson I one, the, the kind of the bog standard variety, basically. So you can get around that. Same for contoniaster, a lot of contoniasters, obviously fantastic for the bees, produce fantastic berries, the birds eat them. And then the birds go and roost next to peat bogs or under into nice native areas of forest. And I've spent the last few months cutting them down from all sorts of places because they're now taking over lots of woodlands that we don't want them in. And they're pushing out lots of food plants for lots of things we're trying to conserve. So unfortunately, I've got a bit of a war going with contoniasters at the moment, though I really like them as a garden plant but they are something to really watch. They can, depending on the species, be quite invasive. So one to watch, I'm afraid. And a wee bit there on the good old solitary bees, the red mason bee again. You can get these bee bricks and build them into walls and bring them, build them into various other structures and things. You can see the mud that's been used and they use other things as well to sort of seal up the tube. That means one's been in there, it's laid its egg, it's wee larva will be in there now, eating away in the pollen and nectar, that's next year's lot. Some people will put mesh over the boxes. Uh, you sometimes do have to do that. I had a woodpecker that's very partial to finding my boxes and eating the larva out. But then in some ways that's nature as well. You know, it is nature. So I used to let it get so many, but I used to protect some at the same time. And you'll find them in cracks in your walls and things, but you can also use things like this, uh, a post basically with holes drilled in it and they will come and go into those as well. Though this one's an old one that's become quite overshadowed. They like nice sunny open areas that are not too damp. So this one's sort of not getting used by bees but it was being used by all sorts of other reinvertebrates that were going in to basically eat the wood as it was breaking down. So it was serving a second life. And then you've got great things like you'll probably all have seen as the bug hotels. You can hang them up as kind of boxes. You can have wee ones near garden. You can have big, grand, kind of more a palace. Um, you can put these almost anywhere. You know, if you put them in a damp area, that will benefit some insects. They do kind of like partial shade. Invertebrates and wee insects dry out easily. So if they're in direct sunlight all the time, that can sometimes make them too dry. So, the, but some quite like the heat from a wee bit of sun. So sometimes you want to mix, some are quite happy to be in the dark. So you can make wee ones, place them in different places, a big one and place them in one, try stuffing it with all different sorts of things. Um, this one, I, I think it's been wrapped in chicken wire, but actually if you leave it more open in the bottom and kind of build a log pile or leaf pile around the bottom, you can sometimes get hedgehogs and things hibernating in them as well. And then log piles. Oh, you can't underestimate a good log pile or these kind of hibernaculas as well. Dig a pit, fill it full of logs, some rubble, put some access points and then bury it. You can shove a log pile on top or just some other garden feature and you'll get all sorts of things living in there. Our amphibians, for example, they all need somewhere to hide in the winter. So they'll get down there. This is a sulfur turmeric moth. It feeds on dead wood. So it's caterpillars feed on dead wood. So there's a number of moths that caterpillars feed on dead wood. So you need a log pile for those. Um, but also all of these sort of features and provide somewhere for our wildlife to hide in bad weather, to overwinter and to pupate and somewhere to be safe. And also there's some things that like 
eat dead wood and things like wood lice and you know, your slug snails, millipedes, they'll quite happily live their whole lives in some of these places as well. So it's another dimension of habitat for your garden. The only thing I would say is be careful where you get your logs from. Don't don't take any logs that are already you know out in the wild because they're probably habitat already. And don't take them from far afield from your own house because you may bring in some sort of tree disease that's about somewhere or some sort of fungus. And we don't want to be spreading those sort of things about. And yeah, your birds will love it. This is my wee robin. I used to love the log piles, especially if I'd moved anything, it was right in there. And that brings nicely to some bird boxes. Definitely recommend a bird box. So I, my last year, I had two blue tit nests, one blackbird nest and two dunnock nests in the garden. It's a big-ish garden, but it's not huge. And it's amazing how many nests you can get in a garden. But different birds do like different types of nests. So we've got some... Um, these are house martin nests that you can put up and unfortunately house martins are doing really badly just now and I've, unfortunately I see quite a lot of people that are trying to stop them from nesting against their houses and all that you know they don't make sometimes you'll get a few droppings and things when the the, the birds are a wee bit older and the, the fledglings are about to fledge but if you can give them a wee bit of your house it can really really help them they can even get several broods away and then you've got swift boxes house sparrows you know, all these are birds that are really rare. So it's worth thinking about what's in my area and um, is there a bird box that I could help them with? And where can I put bird boxes? These ones, the sparrow ones, are good to actually put up two or three of them in a row. Um, and be careful when you put them up of cats. Um, you know, try and, you've got to think how a cat might be able to get to them because unfortunately I have had cats that have sat on top of where bird boxes are and then eaten both the adults and all that sort of thing. So do, do watch what can reach them and get to them as well. But you can do a lot to support some really rare species because unfortunately when you put up trees and vegetation, that takes a time to mature. So it takes a while for nests to develop, especially the things, that, you know, nest blue tits as well as one of the main examples. They nest in hollows and trees. A hollow in a tree takes a long time to form. And we these days with our houses tend to have our houses a lot better sealed up. So the days we used to have lots of house sparrows and starlings in the roof are, are beginning to go as well. And they're beginning to lose nesting habitat. And this is something we can all sort of really provide for. And you can get lots of, if you're handy with tools, I'm not, you can also make them and you can make them for quite cheap and you can make them with scrap wood and you can get lots of different diagrams. You can make lots of different types by making a bigger or smaller hole or a bigger or closed front or open front. That's what Robin likes. So you can put lots of different types up and you can make them yourself. And of course, if you can feed the birds even better. Put up some bird feeders, you can have them by the window, just watch they don't bang into the window, you may need some stickers or something to scare them off so that they don't actually hit the windows. But you can put in a whole different variety of food, the more variety of food, the more birds you'll get. Do feed in the, the kind of summertime because we don't really want them probably feeding seeds to their young, depending on the species, but most, we don't want them feeding the seeds to their young. But we do want them to be getting a good amount of energy for those adults so that adults can keep going around hunting to feed those young. So it's important to feed all year round as well. Um, you can change some things like watch for peanuts. There's a lot of cases where young birds can choke in peanuts if the parents feed them. them. A lot of parents, birds won't feed them to their young, but if sometimes they do and sometimes wee birds can choke on them. So it's, it's a good thing to only put peanuts in mesh bags and you know, not our me um, not the mesh bags because things can get stuck in those, but you know, the, the proper metal feeders. And that is something to watch. You see all these fat balls with nets on them and peanuts with nets. Those nets can easily get wrapped around their feet. So th they're worth taking off and putting in a proper feeder. Um, try and keep your feeders clean. There's a lot of diseases going around. If you notice any birds looking unwell with droopy eyes or them not eating properly or always like stuff oozing out their beak, it can mean you've got one of the diseases about um, and then it's worth stopping feeding for a while. Like usually two weeks cleaning all your feeders. I've unfortunately had it in the garden. That seemed to help. Unfortunately, sick birds tend to come to the feeders from outside because it's an easy meal. So I tend to give, I tend to take the feeders in, give them a good wash. And even when I've not got time to fully wash them, because I realise that's time quite 
time consuming um, to give a full wash to the feeders. You can run over with a kind of antibacterial wipe or that one that's quite, um, you know, it's kind of baby safe, you know, something that's not too toxic. You can give them a quick really take them in, give it a quick wipe over, let it dry, maybe give it a quick wipe with some water, put them out, it's a bit quicker. So I tend to be quite strict with doing it because we've had a few cases with disease coming in around the feeders and that is something to watch, keep an eye on. Um, if you're worried about mess, just watch what type of feeders you use. And you can use things like sunflower seeds. There's a lot less mess with sunflower seeds, sunflower hearts. Um, so you can alter the type of food you use. We have a bird table at the foot of the garden and so far had no birds feeding on it. It's had a sparrowhawk and a buzzard that sat on it. So kind of swacked and there's a bird table. Uh, we actually had a peregrine sitting not far from it. Funnily enough, at the weekend, uh, sitting on the power line nearby. So it's more attracting birds of prey, it would seem at the moment, but I was quite happy with that as well. And then ponds, another another great feature to put in your garden. And a pond does not need to be a big hole in the middle of your garden. A pond can be a tiny wee thing. Most of my ponds are tiny. If you're worried if you've got kids or grandkids and you're worried about them maybe falling in the ponds and you want a wee bit more security around the water, you can try a raised pond. Uh, you can have a, even a very small raised pond. I mean, this is the size of a wash basin, but it still, it actually had... Um, some uh, damselflies trying to lay eggs in it one of the years. I don't know how successful they actually were, but they certainly were trying. Um, and certainly this pond's in our new garden, this one in the bottom, and it was visited last year by dragonflies. Just sort of checking it out, it was a wee bit immature, the pond maybe for them to lay eggs. But we were also getting a wee solar powered fountain and we were getting all the house and the tree sparrows bathing under it. So it was acting as a water source. We're in quite a dry area and kind of agricultural area. So it again has helped provide just as a water source. So I really recommend a pond. And also if you are worried about safety and things, you can put lots of vegetation around them. You'll notice this in the sustainable drainage ponds that councils and things put in, that there's often lots of plants around them. One of the reasons for that, lots of marginal vegetation. One of the reasons for that is actually to stop people from going too close in case they fall in. So you can use things like that as well if you're wanting a bigger pond. And really the key thing is to make sure you have different depths, you know, you have shallow bits, you have deeper bits, but you also have nice ways out for anything that's in there, but will want out at some point, like frogs and toads, etc. But also uh, if a hedgehog or something accidentally falls in there, you want to be able to give it a way out as well. And yeah, this is a photo in the garden. As you can see, this is not a big pond. This is the size of a big sink, you know, when these sort of big industrial sinks, but it's still a big sink. And um, I don't know how many frogs you can see in there, but I believe there's 10 in that photo. There's like one hiding here, and then there's another one there. There's more obvious one there, and then there's three in the plant pot. And most of these are just hanging out in the summer in the warm weather. Um, great pest control for the garden, though, having all of them running about as well. And then, of course, you've got the hedgehogs. So these are probably one of our most declining mammals. They are certainly in trouble. Um, the, the, I, I actually saw my first one when I came to Stirling Uni. My local area is quite well built up that I was coming from, and the hedgehogs were just not about anymore. And it was only when I went to Stirling Uni, and there's quite a lot of them on the campus, I saw my first hedgehog. A friend sent me this photo of a hedgehog dropping really excitedly. He sent me this photo went, look what I've got. I, I, I recognised where a hedgehog dropped. I went, wow, you've got a hedgehog in the garden. Uh, so it's something I get very excited about. I found this one just coming into my front garden not so long ago. I've got a hedgehog. But one of the key things that started bringing them into the garden was making sure they could get in the garden. The garden was surrounded by fences. They can't climb. Um, so by cutting these holes, these hedgehog highways, these holes or boring a hole through walls, you maybe have to talk to your neighbours about this, but you you can this makes a huge difference. It allows them, rather than having to go around huge convoluted routes around housing estates to find ways into these gardens, which usually are brilliant habitat for them, they can just go straight between the gardens. Also means less walking over roads, and as we all know, hedgehogs and roads, not a good thing. They are really bad at getting stuck in litter and get stuck in holes. So if you've got a big dip or a hole or an uncovered drain, 
do to make sure it's either covered or they can get out of it because they're really bad at falling down it. They're really bad at getting stuck in rubbish and basically their spines get stuck, go in a narrow space with rubbish, spines get stuck, they can't reverse out. So just think about what's around the garden and if anything can get spines caught up in it and because unfortunately they, they do die a lot of these things. And also, if you get, and I know a lot of uh, slug pellets and things are banned and pesticides are banned for gardens, but do try and not use these at all because they, they basically, even if the hedgehog's not come in direct contact with them, the things that it eats probably are, and then these can get into it. And a lot of them, even some of the ones that are still about, we, we really don't know what it might do to our hedgehogs. So please try not use these ones. But what you can do is instead you can use, um, natural pest control and I've just went forward the slide there we go so you can use natural pest control and a lot of this by basically doing what we've been talking about you can get your natural pest control let the hedgehog into your garden that'll deal nicely with the slugs and snails I had loads of frogs and we did have loads of slugs but they kept it lovely in check get those flowering plants and support those parasitoids this is a ladybird that's actually just molted from the larva to the adult Ladybirds love green fly. There's that hoverfly larva again, eating green fly. Um, wasps, the social wasps, the wasps that, that, that do sting, those wasps um, also will eat huge numbers of aphids and garden pests. Things that live in the log piles will eat huge numbers of garden pests. Blue tits, a family needs about a thousand insects a day, usually caterpillars. Um, so by putting in bird boxes, there's some forestry projects in Europe using bird boxes to be able to increase uh, pest control in forests now. And yeah, there's there's my garden. You see loads of hostas. No holes in the hosta leaves from the slugs because that was just full. Anytime there was wet weather, it was full with frogs hopping around with odd toad munching away on all of the slugs and they kept them lovely and in check. But wildlife safety is a big thing. As seen for the hedgehogs, this is my local area. We had, this is all things I rescued out of drains. Unfortunately, frogs and toads, they follow along beside curbs. They try to get up. They then fall down the drain. They get stuck in the drain and they actually very slowly drown over weeks or even a month or more. Um, they can't get out um, and they're just stuck down there until they die, which obviously is not great. I tend to go around now with a wee um, telescopic net that I can fit down the drains. And I took about 60 out of local drains in my area last year. So you can see how it can wipe a population out. And these are some of the wee ones that were rescued. But you can put like a bit of mesh going down into the drain that helps them out. Or you can start asking your local council to put in things like these toad ladders. Very simple thing and it allows them to easily get these amphibians out. And also another thing, this, this is in my local area, and we've got the street lights. Everybody's got lights around their houses as well. Some have loads of lights in the garden, but unfortunately a lot of our nocturnal insects, nocturnal mammals, they really don't like lots of light. So this is something else to think about, is how much light and where there is light getting into your garden, can you screen it a little bit? Can you put a hedge in? Can you put a tree in? Can you form a wee dark area? Because that will really help a lot of our garden wildlife as well. And one of the main things is just kind of litter as well and anything, anything gets stuck in as well because uh, unfortunately it's quite sad that the amount um, wildlife can get caught in litter. A big one I've seen of recent is football nets. See if you can tie these up after they're finished with. I've seen foxes caught in them, uh, hedgehogs caught in them. Um, yeah, a lot of wildlife doesn't quite see them at night and runs, especially if it's had a fright, headlong into the net and then gets wrapped up in it. So it's something to watch out for. And yeah, this is a tree bumblebee I found caught in a piece of plastic that was successfully extracted and got away. It popped through a wee hole in the plastic and got totally stuck, but managed to get him out and, or her out because it's a queen now intact. And then I've only got a few more slides, but this is just a wee plug almost for moth trapping. Amazing what you'll find in moth traps in your garden. And you, you don't actually need to just moth trap to see moths. You can look for the leaf miners. I really encourage this. Have a look at um, UK leaf miners. It's really, really fascinating. Uh, also, you can look for some of the ones out by days, like this wee Maganoptrix in the buttercup flower. This is such a cool little creature when you see the colours of it. 
And then you can do the moth trap. So, God, this is a Robertson trap. This is like the Rolls Royce of moth trapping. A uh, really big trap will bring in maybe a thousand moths in a really good night. And that's like, that's, that's probably like expert version. And then you've got things like this that are sort of in between. And then you've got things like this. And I love these wee traps. This, the trap, the electrics and the veins of this trap are only 30 pounds. So a lot of moth traps are quite expensive. This one's quite cheap. It will not bring in a huge number of moths. Um, it will bring in, well, actually, I've had up to 100, 120 in the trap in a really good night, but it's usually about 30. And it will bring in a really good range. I've had over 200 species come to one of these. Um, so if you're just getting into moths and, you know, want a cheap trap to get started, these, these are UV LED traps. Uh, they're kind of three watts of power, powered off a battery really nice trap they're also really robust if you're like me and a bit clumsy and tend to break things that is really hard to break where some moth other moth traps are not so hard to break um but it's amazing we you know like almost three thousand moths in the uk they are there year round there is moths out just now in the good nights you can still get stuff in december you can get the amazing december moth um and it changes every few weeks what's there so there's always plenty to see so i, I encourage it as something to have a have a go at um and yeah this this was my surprise i i was so busy looking in the trap and then i noticed this thing in the corner i thought oh, i've never had one of these in my garden trap and there it was an elephant hawk moth uh and all of its glory uh i mean finding that was such a oh it was just so amazing that made my day week and probably month actually finding that and please put your records in. This is just a wee plug to put any records in. It's amazing how, so what I should say is with all these things, Liz, before my talk there, gave a, a plug for being part of the planning team. And with all these things, I'm seeing like the toad ladders, the, the lighting and thinking about that disturbance to wildlife and disturbance in your local area. A lot of that's from new development. So you can contr contribute a lot by helping with things like the planning. And one of the things the planning team uses your records as well. So even if you're not volunteering for the planning team, I really encourage you to put in your records because it might help the team in putting in um, information to, to planning requests that are out there. And also the council planners, etc. all this information really is used and things are changing in the way in Scotland that it's going to be used more and more. So if you can use even the most simple way I record get a wee app for the phone and put them in, or you can email or send them into your local recorders as well. And you never know what you might find as well. So this was that apple leaf miner. That is Lanarkshire there. There's no dot in the map. So I don't think it's been recorded in my vice county. That, that's like, you know, that's our number one goal, a new one for your vice county almost. A new one for Scotland's probably number one, but new for your vice county, that's a pretty good goal. And then... It, this wee moth, I'm not going to try and pronounce the name, lives in bird's nests. Lovely wee thing again, wee micro moth. And I believe that's its dot in the map. So in this 10 kilometre square, that's like the next next grade down is something you really want to get as a new 10k record. I believe that might be its 10k there. Or somebody very close to me has got a record at the same time, one of the two. Um, but you can look these up on East of Scotland moths, and I do this quite regularly. Oh, have I got something new? Sometimes it's amazing. Quite common species are not recorded in your area. And especially things like moths and indicator species, we use them for all sorts of science and climate change science. All these records, not just of moths, of anything, anything biological, they're all used in research work and development proposals. It's crucial we have these data sets. So even if you just put in the odd casual record every now and again, it does make a big part of the bigger picture as well. And yeah, just here's some places to get some links about wildlife gardens. So Royal Horticultural Society have a great plant finder database and you can search by pollinator or wildlife friendly plants. Bumblebee Conservation have a similar one that's really good. Uh, the Wildlife Trust, the Wildlife Trust in general and Scottish Wildlife Trust have got, you know, of attracting your wildlife to the garden pages. So does RSPB, bringing bugs to your garden and bug life. Uh, these all have some of these things I've been talking about and more butterfly conservation too. One I really want to highlight is this one between RSPB and Barrett Homes. Barrett Homes being a housing developer. And they have actually produced this guide to a wildlife garden. They give it out to their new homeowners 
it's available publicly online as well. And it shows you how to have a functional garden, a family garden, including to play football in, including to have neat mowing lawns, to have seating areas, have all the things you could possibly want in a garden, but also to have wildlife built in. It's a really good guide. So RSPB and Barrett Homes Guide to Garden and to Wildlife, really worth having a wee look online. And it shows you how you can really build that into your garden, but still having that functional garden you don't have to sort of let it all grow wild so thank you very much for for listening and any questions we'll be taking some from the chat but also feel free that's my email there in the bottom and feel free to email me too and also if you want any more links or anything as well i'm happy to send people links most of the things i've got in the talks i've got some sort of link or guide sheet that i can send folk as well so just let me know Perfect. Thanks so much for that, Stuart. Awesome. Um, so yeah, so um, that was fantastic to hear about um, your journey and how you've created a wildlife friendly garden um, and some of the steps that other people can take as well um, just to help wildlife in their local area. Um, just little things people can do. Um, and it was fantastic. Thanks so much. I feel so much information. I learned a few things as well, so that was amazing. Um, I particularly liked your analogy between the peat and the balloon. I thought that was quite cool. Um, so if anybody does have any questions, please do put them um, in the chat. But, uh, we've had some come in already. So I'll just start off with them, if that's okay, Stuart. Yeah. Um, so Peter asks, um, how can we source uh, local wildflower seeds? Um, and Ailey highlighted um, Scotia seeds. But I was just wondering if you had any further comments on that or any other um, suppliers that you knew of. Yeah, I mean, there there is a few out there. I mean, check some of your local areas, have a look at some of your local plant nurseries because some will be producing local seed. Scotia seed is the big one. Scotia seed have put in a lot of research um, into their uh, into their seed mixes. They locally source some from Scotland. I've actually just used some in the garden, and they are in Fife from Fife. Um, so Scotia has to be number one for Scotland, but there is some locally. And what I would really encourage as well is, um, you know, when you're coming into the sort of autumn and you see a nice wildflower you would like in the garden, collect some seed uh, and, you know, grow it in the garden. And the more local you can get it, the better. So if you see things on your normal walks around your area, do, do collect the seed up and, uh, you know, have a go at growing it in the garden. That's maybe the best way. But... There is other companies out there, but Scotia, Scotia is probably the main one, to be honest. And any time I've looked, I've always arrived back at Scotia Seeds. Really good seed mixes, um, a lot of good availability as well. So, uh, But do have a look at your local nurseries because there is a few others out there. And then um, Melissa's just posted in the chat as well about um, Celtica wildflowers as well. Um, yeah, some really good Scottish suppliers out there. Um, thanks for that. So um, next, we've, um, Jenny says that um, I've always wanted to make a bee box, but I've read online that they can sometimes be bad for bees due to parasites. Uh, do you have any advice on how to take um, care um, of a bee box? Yeah, I mean, they, they, they can be. Um, they, they can produce parasites because it is bringing quite a large group of bees together. You can replace them if they're getting a bit kind of worn out and usually you'll see that but you don't want to replace them when they still have young bees in them that's the one thing to be honest I've never found them having a great impact I've never found the parasites having a huge impact a lot of them are there naturally anyway and a lot of the time the biggest limiting factor seems to be more the bees don't have enough places to nest in but a lot of these bees they can make up a lot of nest chambers um, but the problem is finding the nest chambers to take advantage of. So you can try and clean them and things, but the risk, the risk of that is you might have bees in there, you know, you might have a larva in there. And if you clean them or replace them, you might be destroying the larva itself. So I, I, I think it's go, go for it and have a look and see what see what happens with them. And I think especially if you know there's a lack of nesting sites in your area, I think you're always going to be doing more of a benefit. And a lot of these parasites being noticed won't be there anyway. They're they're part of the ecosystem. I've not heard of it being a catastrophic problem uh, with any of the solitary bees. Um, so I don't think it's something to be worried about too much. I've not noticed that it's a big problem myself. Okay, perfect. Thanks for the useful information there. Um, so we've also got um, Sylvia says, 
they, um, they've been given a butterfly house and a tract in for Christmas. And they're wondering if you had any advice as to where they could locate it in a small garden. Yeah, so so th these these tend to work in a, a variety. They either work or don't work. Sometimes I know I put some up and never got things in it or never got butterflies in it, but you'll often get other insects in it. So you want somewhere that's got shelter, but it's still quite warm. So it's got a bit of sun coming in because this is really a place where you want them to be able to overwinter in normally for these butterfly houses. Sometimes if, it, if there's one with a sugar attractant, you might get ones feeding on it. And again, if it's one that's more, it's a, a food attractant that you're putting out, if it's a, a sugar attractant you're putting out, a nice sunny area because that allows the butterfly to come in, drink some nectar and bask at the same time. So, and they quite like to do that because it helps them warm up their wings. So yeah, if it's one more from the hibernate and a, you kind of want a bit of shelter, but you know, it's still getting a bit of that sun's heat in the winter, but you don't want to in direct sunlight because it might get too warm and come out too early. So it's, it's a bit tricky. It's sometimes worth having a couple and trying them in different places. For butterflies, especially for overwintering, you don't want somewhere too damp and dark um, because they can get fungal infections and things. So they tend not to choose them. If you do get it wrong, what you tend to find is you'll get other insects in there as well. You may get ladybirds or lace wings and stuff. If it's one of these sort of hibernation boxes, um, you'll get other things in there. So you can't really go wrong. Same for a lot of the bird box types, actually, that I went through. Um, you know, if if you don't get the bird you're after, something else will go in there. It might even be a tree bumblebee that makes a nest out of it. But usually something will have a go at it eventually. So they're never wasted. That's great, thank you. Um, so yeah, so any more questions, please put them in the chat. Um, so we put one from um, Ralph. Um, he asked, uh, what is a good substitute for ragwort? And um, also there's a lot of red berries uneaten around him at the minute. Um, any reasons why for that? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, for other things from ragwort, I would go for, they're based basically in the daisy family. So anything like that, it's a good substitute. Thistles are probably actually quite good as well. You know, thing that some of you are keeping thistles and things, if you're willing to have them, they'll be really good. Napweeds, really good. Um, really, a whole variety of wildflowers. So basically, you want a wildflower that looks a bit like that type of flower. So if you think that's a nice big open type of flower, a nice big open landing platform, try and get another wildflower that looks similar and that, that's a good replacement as well and the more you go for wild the better um because it's more likely to have something else that will eat it as well on the berries front i don't have an absolute answer i have a i, I suspect what might be going on as i've kind of seen it here is we've had such a mild winter um and there's been quite a mild winter in the continent as well that we're not seeing a huge amount of the migratory uh, birds mainly the thrushes um coming in so they eat a lot of our berries and a lot of our birds probably haven't had the need for them so we had quite a good berry crop though so we've probably had a good berry crop but not a bad winter so that's probably why quite a lot of them are gone uneaten they've just not been needed yet but well the winter's not over yet so we'll see what happens Sab, thanks for that um, so I have two questions as well, and I'm going to use uh, my progress chair to ask these. Um, so if uh, someone has some like restricted space, so say an uh, urban balcony or something, do you have any tips for what they could do with a smaller space in an urban area? Yeah, absolutely. So if you if you've got even just say a wee window box, um, go for a go for a nice wildflower seed mix. Go for one of these nectar rich you get a lot of them that describe themselves as nectar rich pollen rich ones um there's some of these have got species in them that you know we maybe don't find um in scotland a lot and i would say if you're growing a proper wildflower meadow that's in a wild area you wouldn't want to go for them because you're potentially introducing some non-native if it's a window box though go for them really good for nectar and you can bring in a lot lot of wildlife that way if you can get a bird feeder up, you might be surprised at what comes in um, to your feeders as well. Uh, if you provide water as well, you know, especially in urban areas, water can sometimes be a bit short. So that might bring things in or just go for some really strong nectar plants. And especially if you can get a sort of year round few plants for each stage of the year, 
that might work really well as well. But uh, you know, if you can string a bird box to the balcony, you never know. Um, you may get something in it. I know people have put bee boxes in as well, and I've had that. So it, it's worth trying all these things. But I, I would go for a nice, um, as diverse as you can, rich wildflower meadow with lots of nectar plants. Um, and to be honest, you never know what else you might get, even if you allow some grass to grow up in the, the sort of basket or whatever you're putting out, you might find you get large yellow windowing caterpillars living in it and all sorts. So small is definitely not a problem. You could even try a very small pond, you know, just made out of a bowl even. You, okay, you won't get a frog in it, but you may, you'll may you certainly get kind of midgy larva and things like that as well. Um, and that can be quite cool, just seeing what will arrive. All sorts of wee aquatic insects that can use that wee amount of water as well. Um, fab, thanks for that. So we've just had a, a question pop in from Helen. Um, can you suggest um, a tree with small roots suitable for growing near to a house as they've just moved into a new build? Ah, right. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's what I have to care about. I mean, a lot, you'll get a lot of quite shallow rooted uh, things. Some, depend, I'm trying to think of a good, good one now uh, to put in, but I mean, I know some birches as well, especially if you don't allow them to grow too big. So that can be an option. Hawthorn can be an option. You get non-spiky hawthorn. There's an American hawthorn that's non-spiky. Fruit trees don't often tend to have that deep roots either, um, especially if you're coppicing them and keeping them quite small. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of it's just about keeping the tree in check sometimes, you know, a, a tree won't keep developing lots and lots of roots if it's always been kept quite small. Um, so yeah, I, I would go for one of the kind of native broadleaves, um, something like, even rowan are not hugely deep rooted if they're not growing into huge trees. So I would go for something with lots of berries, lots of berries and some nice nectar and plants or a fruit tree. Um, that's the one that a lot of housing developers use, certainly in front gardens as well. Crab apple, crab apple is a good option as well, uh, and fruit trees. So that's that's what they are really going for just now, or wee birch trees or rowans. Um, that's sort of their main use. So something like that. All of them to be birch trees are wee, they don't have as much um, sort of berry power or flower power as such. But what they do have is they get lots of moths eat them basically. So you get lots of caterpillars. Um, so yeah, ha have a look at what local trees you, you've sort of got available, what's doing well in your local area. You could even try something like dog rose, uh, which is more of a shrub. Um, great flowers, great berries, and a lot of things eat the foliage as well. So yeah, lots of really nice options. Woodland Trust webpage, have a wee look through the Woodland Trust webpage, and they've got wee bios on each of uh, our native tree species, and they do include things like how you know, deep the roots and things go, what size they grow to, but also what wildlife they can attract as well. Fab, thanks for that, that's great. Um, so last question is more of a personal one for you. Um, what's the favourite species that you've found in your wildlife friendly garden? If you wow. can, if you can <laughs> yeah, if you can <laughs> come up in one, or do you need a top three? <laughs> I, I think it, it's, I've, I've just been, it's probably, Oh, it's, it's such a question. There's so much. I have to say, during lockdown, thinking about you know, kind of mental health wise, I've been writing a PhD up. It's just been so amazing seeing the wildlife and going through some quite hard times and just being able to go out in the garden, you know, standing out there in the dark with a net looking for moths or butterflies coming in, you know, just catching something like a brimstone moth, really common, but just seeing that in my own garden, that's amazing. Probably the really wow moment was finding that um, that elephant hawk moth in the trap. I didn't see it when I first went in the trap. I, there was loads of moths around about the trap and there was some things trying to fly away in the trap. I was totally distracted by all of that going on. And it was only when I got through all of that, probably about half an hour later, that I noticed it in the corner and thought, is that what I think it is? And I've caught them in public events and I've caught them in a place, but I've never, never got one in a garden, my garden that's been my own and I've always been wanting one. So that was, I'd even left some rosebe willow herb in the garden thinking maybe, maybe I'll get one if I do that. And yeah, just after that, one did turn up. So the figure of 80 moth was unexpected. That was another one. Um, but even some of the birds even getting, last winter I had some um, red poles started turning up in the garden for the first time 
the new gardens actually got house sparrows yeah. and seeing them turning up and having them in the garden this is you know quite a countryside thing not something I've had before but I think yeah I could go on with an endless list it's just amazing every time you see something new um you, you know on Saturday there I looked out the window at the telegraph pole next to the garden I thought that looks like a huge pigeon wait a minute that's not a pigeon Hang on, is that a peregrine? What's a peregrine doing sitting here? Uh, and, and yes, it was. It was a peregrine um, sitting on there. And I sent it to a friend who immediately said to me, oh, I've just had two red kites in the garden. And I thought, OK, that, I think that's upstaging slightly. But imagine having that in the garden. So I think yeah. the key message is you never know what you might get is just keep an eye on your garden, put in as many of these uh, wildlife measures and I, I think you'll be surprised at what you get. I know people in Stirling that get nut hatches to the garden. I'm still trying for that one. Um, you, there's so much great wildlife out there and the amount of times I've went for a wee wander in the garden, a 15 minute break from lunch and found something that I've not even known what it was and just gone, wow, what is this? Uh, and yeah, so uh, yeah, it was really, Put put in some wildlife measures and see what comes, and you you will find something amazing. Uh, and it's so hard to pick favourites. <laughs> that's amazing. Thanks so much. Um, it's great to see your enthusiasm about it. It's really infectious. So that's amazing. Thanks. Um, so um, that's all of the questions that we have at the moment. So I'll just do a little summary. Um, so. Yeah, so our next um, talk is going to be uh, online in March. It's the first Tuesday in March. So please do keep an eye out um, on your emails for that and any information of that. Um, also, please do check out our website for some more information about the planning team and how you can get involved with that. It's an amazing um, uh, group to be part of. They do some amazing work. So please do check it, get, check it out and get in touch if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, just lastly, thank you so much, Stuart, um, for your talk. That was amazing. It was really fascinating to hear about it um, and all the amazing things that you've seen and done in your garden and all the tips that people can do um, for their gardens as well. And also, um, thank you, everybody, for all your questions and thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. So thanks again. Thank you.